Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone for tuning in on this wonderful Palm Sunday morning. I pray that everyone is weathering the storm, and I know that our leaders, they've been reaching out to people in our church and keeping me posted on how everybody's doing. And so I want to thank those who are reaching out, who are calling. Remember, we are needing to be the church one to another at this time. And just a quick note, um, you know, I, I want to thank those who have contacted us in reference to their giving, their tithes, and their offerings. Yes, we still have bills to pay. Yes, we still have a mortgage. Uh, so if you have any questions, contact uh, Pastor Denver, contact Shay, we'll get you that taken care of. Also, want to thank Pastor Eric last week for his inspirational message. Um, it's just a great time. It came at a great time for what is taking place in our world. And today, this is our third week of not being able to meet together. And so just to let you know, I cannot wait till we are all back together again. And we're in the same place and we can wrap our arms around each other in love. So church, be in prayer. I, I, I know that many of you are praying and I just want to say, be in prayer. And this week is going to be a great time for us to focus our prayer life. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But I want to make sure everyone tunes in next Sunday at 9.30. Uh, Pastor Weber is going to lead us in a time of prayer. We're going to take just a small break from Sunday school as we know it. And at 9.30, we're going to corporately come together as a body for a time of prayer. So I want to, everyone to see what next week is going to look like. Because next week is Easter Sunday. It's the day that we celebrate the empty tomb. So we will have a sunrise service at 7.07, followed by a time of prayer at 9.30. Then we will have service at 10.30. So tune in. Even though it's going to be virtual, tune in on Facebook Live or over Zoom. And do not give up meeting together as Satan would have us do. But let the church rise up in a mighty and powerful way. And let us be powerful in this world. And that leads us right to where we're going to be today for our message. The title of our message today is Our Heart and Our Response. See, our heart will dictate our response. And at the end of this pandemic, at the end of this time that we are going through this season, my prayer is that each and every one of us, we have a heart that is a spiritual place where we are driven about the things of God, to be in His house, to be following His commands, regardless of what's going on in the world. So right now, would you join me on this wonderful Palm Sunday morning? And let's pray. And I understand that we are online. I understand that we are not together in His house. But see, when we pray, when, we have, when we're in our homes, they have a tendency not to truly embrace the attitude of prayer. I challenge you right now. Turn your focus to Jesus. Let's completely enter into his presence. And, and let's expect to communicate with the great and mighty God who needs to hear from us. So join me right now as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we are gathered in this way, Lord, I thank you. I praise you that we do have this ability to gather as a church in your holy name, Lord. I wish we were together. I wish we could see one another's faces. But until that time, we are still going to focus on you. We're still going to learn from you. And Lord, as we are gathered to listen to your word, I pray that our hearts are open right now. Pray that our minds are open. Maybe even more so than if we were gathered here. I pray that we are open and we are prompted to grow more and learn more about you. Lord, as we've been reaching out, we've been talking to people from the church, we've been hearing so many needs and, and there's so many people who just, they're longing to be back in fellowship and I feel it too. But until that time, Lord, help us to all know that you are still here. You still reign. And you are still a great, mighty God. So, Lord, as we break into your word, 
meet us here on this wonderful Palm Sunday. And may we here strengthen you. We love you, Lord. And we're going to give you all the praise because you are a great and mighty God. It's in your name we pray. We serve a great God. Amen? I hope you're in your home saying amen. <laughs> now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but do you realize that everything you do, you leave evidence? Your life is evidence, and the people around you, the people that you share life with, they see it. With their word, with their reaction, you leave evidence of your heart. Now, knowing what you do with evidence, the evidence is always analyzed. So what we should be thinking about is what does our evidence say about our lives? Now, we may think we're smooth. We may think we've got the right words, the right look, the good works. But at the end of the day, the residual evidence reveals the true heart. There was a man who returned a brand new computer to a retail, a national retailer that we've all shopped in. And the man was said he was disqualified with the way the printer printed. And uh, so he took it back in, he was returning it. When the clerk looked at the machine, the clerk noticed that the man had accidentally left something behind in the printer. The man had left behind counterfeit bills that he was trying to print. He thought he was being smart. He thought he was being smooth and, and trying to get away with something. But the residual evidence revealed the true heart. This is why we must be intentional as we turn our lives over to Christ. Now, in church words, you call it consecrate. We must consecrate our lives over to God. And we must live our lives for Him. We are at a great time, a great season to make that decision. To make the choice to be intentional in our spiritual life because our heart will dictate our response. Again, today is Palm Sunday. And the internet is exploding with stories of Jesus and how he makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Have you ever wondered what that looked like? See, whenever a team wins a national championship, there's always a big parade, and they're always welcomed by their home fans. But I'm pretty sure that most players would rather ride on the back of a, a big trailer pulled by a semi, and they're waving to their fans, rather than riding on the back of a donkey. But when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, this was a big deal. And this is important to us as Christians in our faith. The Gospels tell us, of Jesus, who was riding in, and it was a glorious celebration. But it was more than just that. It was also the fulfillment of prophecy. Zechariah 9 9, and I love the way it says in the, East, uh, the English Standard Version. It says this Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble. And mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. See, 500 years, even before Jesus walked this earth, Zechariah was given this word by God. That the one who is salvation would humble himself and ride on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Now, in order for us to get the big picture here, I want to take us on a journey. I'm going to take us back to John chapter 11. Now, in our text today, we're going to be in John chapter 12. But I want to take you back to John chapter 11, because this is something that happens even before Jesus enters Jerusalem. See, Jesus had a good friend, a very close friend, and his name was Lazarus. Lazarus was his friend who died before Jesus could get back to Bethany. And Jesus does something incredible. Jesus goes to where Lazarus was laid, and, and he tells the people to roll away the stone that blocked Lazarus' grave. And remember, now everywhere that Jesus went, there was this crowd. And Jesus tells those who were there, the crowd that had assembled, Jesus says this, Did I not tell you that if you believe, 
you will see the glory of God. And when Jesus goes to the tomb, he cries out, Lazarus, come out. The dead man comes out, and he's alive. Jesus gave to us indisputable evidence of who he was and of his power. The man who was dead is now alive. And this news begins to spread like wildfire. People are tweeting it. It's on Facebook. Vendors are making t-shirts and they're making coffee mugs. They're trying to monopolize on this incredible event that Jesus had just brought the dead to life. And this event began to stir and turn the hearts of those who heard what Jesus has done. Now, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, John tells us that the chief priests, they weren't happy about this. Not at all. Because the people, the Jewish people who saw everything that was taking place, they stopped looking at the chief priests and started looking to Jesus. They stopped looking to the chief priests and the chief priests were losing their influence. There is now indisputable evidence walking around and testifying that Jesus is the Messiah. And the people were seeing and believing in Jesus. Think about this. How much attention would a person get if they were dead for four days and then suddenly they were brought back to life? See, Lazarus, he's exhibit A. He's telling everyone what Jesus had just done for him. And the chief priests, they didn't like it. So they plotted to kill him. Not only did the chief priests want to kill Jesus, they wanted to kill Lazarus as well. See, if we have the wrong heart. If our heart is wrong, we will want our problems to be removed. We want them to go away or we want to kill them. And this was the attitude of the chief priests. And the events that took place with Jesus and with, even with Lazarus, it led the Sadducees to form an alliance with the Pharisees. In John chapter 11, it tells us the chief priests and the Pharisees, they called a meeting of the Sanhedrin or the, of the council because Jesus had all these people begin to follow him. And do not forget John, uh, Jesus tells us in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus tells us. And that's what the people were doing. The miracle of Jesus bringing Lazarus back from the dead weakened the position of the chief priests. So now there was a full-on conspiracy against Jesus. And Lazarus, he was also on that. This is what can happen when people become leaders and they can get a little bit of power. If a leader has the wrong heart, any threat that is made against them, anything that jeopardizes their position, it must be dealt with. It must be killed. Elliot writes that even though Lazarus was never charged with a crime, his witness, his very life, was a threat to the position and to the influence the chief priests had. So they wanted Lazarus dead right alongside Jesus. Lazarus was a powerful testimony. And because he had the right heart, because he had the right response, he was a living testimony to Jesus. And this went against the doctrine, it went against the power and everything that the religious leaders wanted in this world. We must remember, we must remember this backstory because all this takes place before Jesus makes his historical entrance into Jerusalem. So now I hope you have your Bibles in hand. If you haven't turned to John chapter 12 yet, please do so now. In church, as we read God's word, as we break into God's word, I want to challenge you. You may be comfortable in your homes. You may be sitting in your couch, in your love seat. But I challenge you. Would you please stand right now and let's give God's word the reverence that it deserves. So stand with your Bible in hand. Turn to John chapter 12. And let's begin reading 
starting in verse 12. And this is what it says. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on the donkey's pole. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. See, John says there was a great crowd that had gathered because of the news of Jesus. And it was sweeping through the city. These people were grabbing palm branches and they're throwing them down. They're honoring Jesus. And the crowd is yelling, Hosanna! Hosanna! Lord, save us! Now I want us to get a mental picture here of what's taking place. This is not just a group of people standing at one of the many entrances to the city and Jesus entered as if he was leading the football team out onto the field. This group some versions say it's a, it's a multitude that had been following Jesus through the, the narrow streets of Jerusalem. They were waving palm branches and throwing them on the ground in front of them. And these people, they had their hearts aligned with God and they would have been singing the 118th Psalm. They would have been saying, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Now remember, the chief priests, they didn't like what was going on. They liked their power. They wanted their power. They wanted their influence. The Messiah was right in front of them. But because their hearts were not right, their response was wrong. They responded out of selfish desires instead of love. They had every opportunity to follow him. The Gospels are very clear that all those who seek after him will find him. All we have to do to find our Savior is to make the choice to seek him. Matthew 7 tells us, for everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds, and the one who knocks on the door, that door will be open. God doesn't open the door to some and shut that door in the face of others. That's not love. But for those who make the choice, those who seek him with an open and repentant heart can find him. For those who respond to Jesus and for those who receive his saving grace, we must continue to grow and to learn more about who Jesus is. That's what we talked about a couple weeks ago. Our spiritual journey does not end when we first receive our salvation. We must continue in our holiness because here's the danger. If we do not continue in our faith, we risk being turned by the world around us. It's what we see in John's gospel. The people heard what, John, uh, what Jesus had did at Bethany. They saw Lazarus and they began to follow Jesus. Their eyes were open. It says great crowds of multitude. They heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They heard of what he had done. And so the people found him. They hunted him out. They grabbed the palm branches and they're rejoicing in Jesus the King. He is the Savior. Now I pray that what we see from this event that John records for us is that if we are not intentional and deliberate in growing in our faith, we can lose track, we can lose 
focus on the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. Many of you know right where I'm going right now. Many of you are already thinking about this crowd. The same group of people who were singing Hosanna, Hosanna, later changed their cries to crucify and crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. Some of those who were in the crowd who were giving praise and adoration to Jesus our Lord were turned by the things of the world. They changed their tune to the climate of the world and their hearts changed. Church, if our hearts are not continually growing in the things of God, if we are careless with our faith, we can quickly take our eyes off of Jesus and we seek the selfishness that we want out of this life. Since the fall of man in the garden, our sinful nature has driven our desires. Our sinful nature drives our thoughts and it drives our actions. But holiness is our intentional seeking and trusting in the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is going to do for us. It replaces that sinful nature with the things of Christ and we do what God's Word tells us to do and then we conform into the image of Christ. We're not perfect, but that's our desire. That's what we long for, that's what we strive for. And this is why we must continually examine ourselves through the filters of God's Word. And we must filter our lives for, by everything He commands us to do. There are leaders and people of influence in our world today who, who claim they love Jesus. But the evidence of their heart is seen in how they respond to the ways of the world. They claim to love Jesus. And there are some indicators that they do love Jesus. But yet their actions and their own thoughts and their own ideas are, are, are many times contrary to the commands of Jesus our Lord. And it causes them to be swayed to the world and away from Christ. And when I say the world, I, I'm not, I don't mean the globe. I'm talking about their job, their hobbies, their financial status. Whatever it is, it becomes an excuse not to be engaged in the things of Christ. See, we're told in God's word that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And if that is our heart, our response will be that evidence every time. Look again at just the first part of our passage. The people see that Jesus, he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the Messiah. But those who have power and influence, when they begin to speak into other people's lives, when they begin to get a little bit of a voice, those who do not truly put everything towards Christ, they will be persuaded to think and act in a manner that is contrary to the Spirit of God. See, in this week, in this short week that we read about by John, we saw the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But we also see the Son of God being given into the hands of man as he was arrested. Jesus was taken to his religious leaders before Pilate and eventually turned over to be crucified. And again, these same people who were waving palm branches and singing Hosanna to Jesus were the ones whose hearts were turned by worldly influences. And it led to the crucifixion of our Lord. Do not be reckless in your relationship with Christ. Each and every week we must be intentional. We must be very purposeful in everything we do for Christ. Now here's my challenge for us today. All those who hear this message today, 
Starting this Thursday, I want to challenge each and every one of us to a 72-hour time of prayer and fasting. I am challenging Aztec Church of the Nazarene and believers everywhere to a 72-hour time of fasting and prayer and focusing on the will of God the Father in heaven. With this pandemic that is going on in our world today, with the financial and the social burdens that are still to come, we need the church to rise up and be powerful, to be a church of prayer and fasting. We need our hearts to align with Him. See, incredible spiritual growth can be done when we give ourselves over to fasting and prayer. God's Word is very clear about that. And I don't know of any greater way to make sure that our heart is right than by making the effort to focus on God through prayer and fasting. Church, every one of us, we either have come or we will come to a pivotal time in our spiritual walk with Christ. Your actions each and every day are evidence of where you stand with Jesus. Many people have a relationship with Jesus, but that relationship is self-serving, it's superficial. It, it conforms to the patterns of the world. But God's Word gives us clear direction for our lives as believers in Christ. See, the same Jesus that rose from the grave tells us in Luke 9.23, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me, Jesus said. And God's Word tells us that this is the way that we receive the power of Christ in our lives. See, how we do it is we give everything that we are to a loving and mighty God. Because it's all about Him and not about us. He has the power. We only have the power when we receive it through Him. So church, how's your heart? Many of us are being put to the test right now. At this time of social isolation, at this time when we are unable to gather as we are told to in Hebrews 10.25, we're being put to the test. And that's why this time of prayer and fasting is needed. And see, even though we cannot celebrate this week as we normally would, let's still make the decision, let's make the choice, let's be intentional to pray and to fast and give everything that we are to Him. Despite what's going on around us. Let's make the decision to stand firm in our faith as we reverently honor our Lord who gave His all, gave His life on the cross so that we can live for Him and have eternity with God the Father. My takeaway today is this. Be intentional with your heart and let your response be evidence of your love for Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a great mighty God. And you you gave us the way to find everlasting peace. When Jesus went to the cross for us, he did that because he loves us. And we are so thankful that Jesus was willing to drink from that cup. So Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, I can't even fathom it. I can't even fathom what you endured for us. But as we enter into this week, I pray that our hearts are turned, our thoughts are turned. We learn, we read more about what you did for us. We honor you with our thoughts and our deeds this week, Lord, as we 
give our heart to you as we align our heart with yours. And we pray that our response is the response that you would have from us. Lord, I pray that for every person, Lord, I pray for every person in your church across this world that we die to self. We are crucified, but we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. And that will be the evidence of our love for you. Help us, Lord. We need your, we need your power. Give us that strength. And in the end, Lord, I pray that you receive the glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So church, this Thursday, we begin a 72-hour time of prayer and fasting. If you are willing to join with me, if you are willing to make the choice to take part in this 72-hour time of prayer and fasting, would you respond in an email, in a text, in Facebook? I want to know who is going to be joining and we need to be praying for one another in this time. We need to make sure that we are praying so we all have the strength in this time. Let's do our part to take hold of the power that God has available for each and every one of us. And I'm praying for you. I will be praying for you. Our leaders will be praying for you. And understand that you are loved. We must not, we cannot allow our hearts to be turned just because we cannot gather in the, in the sacred assembly. So let's stand strong, let's stand firm, let's stand united, hand in hand, arm in arm, virtually, in this time of 72 hour time of prayer and fasting. And join me. Church, I love you, and you are loved. Go in peace.